apologise to those who may have forgotten my introduction from this morning. It was a long time ago, it seems, but I'm delighted that we have had such an energetic and highly informed debate today because it has been a debate and an exchange. And the emphasis has been to speak frankly. Sometimes I think perhaps we have pulled our punches, but we should speak frankly about the multiplicity of problems which are confronting the, the Commonwealth as a multilateral association it, to which I believe that there is a coalescence of commitment in this room. We are critical friends and we want to ask, if, is the Commonwealth working and if not, why not? Why are people so resistant to instituting the necessary reforms that we can see clearly are causing structural, uh, it could be said personal, financial and um, institutional failures and uh, impediments to um, the Commonwealth reaching out not simply to governments, but also to peoples of the Commonwealth. Um, we've heard, I quote, I'm more than a little worried, uh, a cri de coeur, acute concerns, serious operational challenges. But in the um, interim, the, in the tea sessions, this is what I always like about bilaterals of discussions of this type, we can have very valuable and fruitful exchanges. And as um, former High Commissioner Guy Hewitt so uh, uh, adeptly commented, the Commonwealth, through its informality and its very flexibility, has the, uh, should we say, the latitude, the sinews which can stretch, which can enable it to address some of its flaws, possibly principal flaws, perhaps enough to keep it going. But this then is in the lap of many peoples and the role of leaderships and active engagement. Now, in terms of programs, these, of course, have been core to the Secretariat's activities since its creation in 1965. Um, in terms of values, then, of course, it was state values, state rights, that were of principal concern in terms of addressing the developmental agendas of the newly independent states that were then members of the Commonwealth. And, of course, in the 1960s, there were merely 22. We are now part of an association which is 54 members. And it, the very diversity and composition of the Commonwealth has, of course, shifted dramatically from its original inception, it could be said in 1949, 65. And is this part of the problem, that as its size becomes more sprawling, as the demands of individual members looking to the Secretariat to deliver what states identify to be their, their national needs, should the Commonwealth, in fact, be more rigorous in applying its institutional sanctions in um, emphasizing the importance of its values, that it abides by those. I think that it should, because then you have a greater commitment and states who wish to join and see the legitimacy, the benefits, the access, the voice that the Commonwealth offers, it has a currency. And it also, unlike the United Nations, if it has a sanction, then it has a cost to not being included. But then that requires political engagement as well as financial engagement. For states to benefit in terms of the developmental needs being met, that requires financial contribution. But it's, of course, not just about money. We have heard resources, resources, resources today um, being emphasized. I looked at some of the statistics for the programs which have funded the Commonwealth Secretariat's work. Um, and, of course, uh, it was a fraught international environment in the 1960s, um, and the Commonwealth was able to carve out for itself a particular, not, it could be said, non-aligned identity, and using it as a platform to uh, gain access to more powerful states to help them to modify their foreign policies. But by um, the mid-90, uh, let me think, 2013, whereas the funding environment in the 1980s had been much more generous, and the Secretariat's um, uh, well, human skill capacity was at 420 people. Um, by 2013, the funding budget of the Secretariat was 51 million, and it, it has dwindled now from 2018-19 um, to 28 million, and I, the latest stats I've seen are 25 million. So it's been effectively cut in half. In terms of the capacity of the Secretariat, I understand it's now approximately 220 people, although um, my colleague, uh, Professor Louis Franceschi, I'm sure will set us straight on that. Um, the former Secretary, uh, Deputy Secretary General for Economic Affairs, um, Ransford Smith, said last month 
the, the struggle for relevance of the Commonwealth has a past and a present. Its responsiveness to the developmental needs of the majority of its members will be a key determinant of its continued relevance and its future relevance. So in his view, it needs meaningful, tangible, tangible and incremental developmental assistance to Commonwealth members and that the Secretariat should look to meet that demand role. Um, I felt that Dr. Indra Kumarasatswami this morning set out some very valuable ways in which that developmental role could be assisted that doesn't simply come back to money. But I do believe that there needs to be a discussion um, among the principal funders for the Secretariat going beyond the Australia, Britain and Canada cohort, the, the, that particular group. Um, but it does need the engagement of states. The former director for political affairs, Max Gaylard, told me that if the Commonwealth has a commitment, a coalescence of eight to 10 heads, it can really achieve political and developmental traction. So again, looking to leadership, it goes beyond the leaders that we mentioned this morning. It goes back again to states. In the last discussion, there was, to my mind, an opening up of um, a potential conflict of values between parliamentary sovereignty and pop, the values of popular sovereignty. I don't see them as being dichotomous. I don't see them being in conflict. I think there is a constructive tension in the Commonwealth with these values of states' rights and interests and serving the developmental agenda of peoples of the Commonwealth and people's rights and their entitlement to call on their government to satisfy their needs and their demands. So I mentioned to Guy that I felt um, Derek Ingram's comment of the Commonwealth having flexibility and the ability to jump into a telephone box and come out in, under a different guise at times of crisis, well, I, that may seem like a rather uh, a Marvel comic pop analogy, um, but the Commonwealth does have the flexibility. It has a past track record of responding at times of crisis. Whether it does now, well, that remains to be seen. But states have to be called to account and leadership has to be called to account. I do think that the Commonwealth is at a particular inflection point. Um, so it's definitely time for all good people to come to the aid of the association. Right, with that, I shall stop my political rant. Um, I'd like to um, introduce our principal speakers, please. Unfortunately, Sandra Papera is unable to join us through illness, and so we send our very best wishes to her for her quick recovery. Um, our first speaker will be um, Professor Louis Franceschi, who is Senior Director, Governance and Peace Directorate at the Secretariat, um, who has kindly agreed to talk on the Secretariat's principal programs and priorities, its current funding and staffing capacity, and the work of the CFTC, the Commonwealth um, Fund for Technical Cooperation. Then, in a slight uh, reconfiguration of the order of speakers, Nicholas Watt, Dr. Nicholas Watts will then speak. He is Senior Research Fellow at the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and Chair of the Independent Forum of Commonwealth Organizations. The Environmental Policy Researcher, he was trustee of the Commonwealth Human, right, uh, Human Ecology Council from 1980 to 2015. Our final speaker um, on today's panel will be Misha Madison-Miles, who is currently a communications lead at uh, Sigenta. She was public affairs advisor and media consultant at the Commonwealth Secretariat from 1997 to 2001 and communications consultant at the Commonwealth Youth Programme from 2003 to 2007. Um, Professor Franceschi has agreed to speak first and he's also kindly agreed to take questions immediately afterwards because I know there's going to be considerable interest in this room on his remarks. So if I could invite Professor Franceschi to begin. Thank you very much, Sue. And first of all, I would like to thank the host, the Commonwealth the Institute of Commonwealth Studies in the University of London, the Commonwealth Foundation, the Commonwealth Association, all of you friends, and the audience, which I think is, this is an extended panel. I mean, all of you have been panelists at some point, and there is an amazing amount of knowledge in this room. Uh, I joined the Secretariat two years ago, as the Senior Director of Governance and Peace. It has been an incredible experience, 
and really is a learning lesson every day. There is something very interesting. When I was told uh, to come and speak at this forum with East the Commonwealth Ward, I said, well, this is a question I ask myself every day. And every day I say, yes, but we can do better. The world is in crisis, and this was discussed, I'm sure, this morning. Multilateral institutions are in crisis. We are in a world where there are companies that have more financial power, and economically speaking, they are bigger than all the countries of Africa and the UK put together, if you look at Apple and Facebook. They will be number five in, in, in the country, in, in the world, in terms of capitalization. And Facebook has more than almost twice the number of people the Commonwealth has, and they are willing citizens because they go into it by a, an act of the will. I want to go to Facebook. And certainly this has shifted priorities. We have a war that has not been properly recognized. And as you know, um, when wars are not properly identified or recognized in law, humanitarian law does not play to come into action. It makes it incredibly difficult for any international organization of any type to come into assistance, to come to assist, because, well, the legal avenues are not open. Why am I saying this? Because being a professor of law, uh, I couldn't resist the temptation of, before telling you about the programs, I had to somehow make sure that we are all on the same page uh, with the world crisis we are facing today. This affects not only the Commonwealth, but every international organization. I was having a conversation with the political director of the Security Council some days ago over lunch, and he was desperate. And he was saying, well, we are becoming a white elephant, the United Nations. And you speak to the political directors of the African Union, the same situation. ASEAN, the same situation. And there is a crisis of identity in these organizations that were founded 150 years ago uh, to connect states that are now connected by social media. And our presidents and prime ministers are governing by Twitter. And I was incredibly happy when, for example, Trump was expelled from Twitter. But I also asked myself who expelled him and why. Who took that decision? And to make a decision to expel the president of the most powerful nation on earth from Twitter, hey, you have to be um, more powerful. <laughs> and then you start asking yourself, well, what is the power dynamics we are involved in? And this is something we live every day also in the Commonwealth. Because as an institution, composed, formed by governments, and directed by governments, and which exist to serve those governments, well, we have 54 uh, governors who have their own agenda. And that whole agenda has been always beautiful, historically beautiful, a family of nations, a club of willing partners, friendship with a purpose. That's the best definition a guard in Marlboro House gave me. The Commonwealth is friendship with a purpose. And I said, well, fantastic. But when the world breaks apart and when countries go into nationalism, then you destroy that purpose because everyone is pulling on in their own direction. And sometimes I ask myself, what would happen if all these countries were pulling in the same direction? Well, in Lankawi in 1989, we were with climate change. And that gave way to the beautiful aspirations of the Paris Agreement. But today, we are not able. And you may say, well, this is a problem of leadership. But it's a worldwide problem of leadership. Perhaps Putin waited for, uh, uh, maybe I'm saying things here that are not politically correct, but Putin waited for Angela Merkel to leave Germany to go into Ukraine. And they said, well, who stood up to Putin? Well, it's, 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 it's a world situation that we are facing, which is quite difficult. Now, how does this affect the Commonwealth? Certainly, 
the Commonwealth does not secretariat does not initiate practically anything on their own. We have to wait for those mandates to be given by heads through the communique, for example, or through state uh, initiative. When, for example, Kenya writes to us and asks for help to put in place a training or, or some system or to strengthen institutions. And of course, we go in to strengthen institutions. Can we do it motu proprio? Well, sometimes we have done it. It is true. There is a mandate the Secretary General has. She can do it, but that leads to incredible, uh, well, criticism sometimes, because who determines the, pri the, the priorities? It could be, or it should be, the states, the governing body itself. So, of course, in these dynamics of power, in this power play we have nowadays, there are quite a number of factors that make these multilateral institutions fall into the same drama the world is in, the crisis of identity. Uh, societies are being de-democratized, powers are playing against each other, even within countries. Um, Latin house institutions are not aligned in the same way, and certainly we face constantly a crisis of identity within the state itself. And that somehow brings down the morale and the structures that maintain democracy alive and make it sustainable. Uh, as I come to this, I will tell you uh, two little anecdotes, true, time, true stories, um, and then I will explain now what we do and how we add through programs to address this. The first one, uh, and this I can mention publicly because it's, it's over uh, and it was a very successful story, and the government, the country itself celebrated it. Uh, Zambia. We were in Zambia for the elections. The Commonwealth has observed around 1,300 elections. Um, it's amazing the work that is done through the election observation, which is now evolving to a, a whole cycle approach. It's not just the election, but what happens before and after. Because election is not an event, it's a process. An election has registration, running of the election, the election day, uh, the structures that are surrounding elections, and then the vote counting that in many places now is uh, virtual. <laughs> so observing in the old days used to be ticking a box. Now you have to go into the servers with experts, data analytics, and see are these numbers the ones coming out correct or there is some ro something wrong with the algorithm. And some countries have told us you cannot get into the servers. And we have told them we are not going to observe the elections because we cannot go there to rub a stamp. Whatever is produced by a machine, we cannot see what is happening inside. But anyway, in Zambia, uh, we had a situation with a country that was heavily polarized between Edgar Lungu and Hichilema. Hichilema had been put in jail 16 times. And Edgar Lungu uh, was a president, and there was not much space for freedom of expression. The media principles are so important. And I'm so grateful that some of you in this room I can see now have been pushing for them. Because certainly you have to put the pressure. The civil society of the Commonwealth have to put that pressure. And then, of course, it's up to us to help convince leaders that this is something, it's a must. But anyway, that's a different story. Um, then, well, uh, the election happened. Internet was cut at 12 midday. I was with Jakaya Kikwete, former president of Tanzania, and he told me, these people do not know how to run these elections. You never cut internet at 12. You cut it at 6 p.m. When the, when the queues are over. So if you cut it at 12, whoever is in the queue will vote against you. He was joking, but, but it's true. It happened. <laughs> so Lungu lost the elections. 
And Lung was reluctant to, to, to hand in power, to concede. And Hichilema was very annoyed with Lungo. He said, eh, well, this government is, uh, he will go to jail. So our job with President Kikwete was to go from Lungu to Hichilema, say, concede, forgive, concede, forgive, concede, forgive, until just in the nick of time, Lungu conceded and called Hichilema his brother. We went to Hichilema. Have you seen the message of Lungu? No, I didn't. I was in a meeting, and that guy, hey, relax, he has conceded. And he called you his brother, do the same. He appeared in national TV, my brother Lungu, the country's bigger than us, forgive him, he didn't say forgive him, but he forgave him. So from that moment, and a photo was taken with the two of them shaking hands in a meeting that was arranged by, by us and the African Union in the house of the late President Panda. And from that moment on, Zambia was rejoicing in peace. Nothing could somehow upset them anymore. That beautiful story tells me the Commonwealth is working, but perhaps it's the best kept secret in London because we are not very good at advertising ourselves and sometimes we can't. Because when you do the good officer's work, and the Secretary General may do something, like she, she spent some time in, in 2017 going from State House to prison uh, to negotiate the release of, of Hichilema. You say, well, when this happens, you can't tweet. And Kikwete was clear, no, no media. I don't want to see any journalist around. And I told the team, no media, not even tweeting. We are not in, in, in Zambia. But okay, it's a beautiful story where lives were saved and the country went into peace. And the same happened in Guyana, when David Granger was not giving in and they spent six months counting 300,000 votes. So it's as if they were counting one by one, every day one vote. So in the end, things were pacified, but Guyana was to the point of going to a civil war so there are very beautiful things happening. However, I agree that there are very numero, numerous avenues for rethinking ourselves, and this is where we need you. And your criticism is very important. Your critique of the work we do is very important and very necessary. Now, in these circumstances, when we find that the world is in a crisis of identity, where the states are failing, where leaders are closing in on themselves, and nationalism is booming, and we can see that the European Union was to the point of disappearance with the recent election in France. And this is happening to, to very many countries across the world, very many regional institutions and international ones. So how do we respond to the needs of the people? Because, of course, the way we are set up, we are responding to the needs of the countries, the states. But at the same time, we have a fiduciary duty to the people. And certainly, in that, with the Commonwealth Foundation, we have to do, and we could do a lot more. So, well, I would say, in democracy, governance, and rule of law, election observation has been one of the main issues the main projects and beautiful experiences of the Commonwealth. It was invented in the Commonwealth and then expanded to the whole world. Countering violence and extremism. Well, more than 1,500 direct beneficiaries of preventing countering uh, 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 violent, uh, violent extremism have been trained and uh, uh, somehow given the tools. Uh, we are in the fashion of building toolkits that are very applicable for countries. So all these needs countries have expressed to us, then you go into the sort of back room, create a toolkit, and that toolkit is applicable not only to that situation, but to all the 54 member states. Um, in governance, more than 2,000 public, senior public servants, permanent secretaries, directors of uh, public service have been trained in performance management. We are trying to create that culture that will put them against the wall. Uh, 
in matters of performance in a good way. Anti-corruption, uh, creating anti-corruption networks in the Caribbean, in Africa, in Asia, and of course bringing all the heads together. Why this? All these programs or projects in trade, combined gross domestic pro pro product of the Commonwealth is, well, and, and many of you have know this, uh, more than uh, 13 trillion. It was in, in 2020, etc. So um, why this? Because part of the strength of the Commonwealth is convening power, open doors everywhere, and precisely the ability to strengthen institutions. And I say, why did war, I mean, was prevented, or why didn't it happen in Zambia? Because the Electoral Commission had been strengthened to be honest enough to release the results that were not favoring the incumbent. And why a war did not happen in Guyana because the court was strong enough to actually issue uh, uh, judgments that were not favoring the incumbent. Uh, and there is a third <coughs> case I cannot mention publicly for security reasons. <laughs> it's still ongoing and we are trying to help, but it's a case where the executive is falling apart and of course, how have we strengthened that? Well, by trying to secure the training and strengthening the public service. So that if the executive fall apart, at least the service delivery does not fall apart. And of course, there are these type of things we go doing in one country after the other. And, and well, those are the little, we could say, joys one can have. It is true, sometimes this goes unnoticed and cannot be said loudly and in public, but anyway, it's the way we, we are also asked by governments to act in that sense, with the trust that their problems will not be uh, exposed. Now, uh, trade is a key issue. We can do much better in trade. I think there is no reason why in trade we should not have created an OHADA, like the French system, to facilitate the free movement of goods within the Commonwealth. It's unforgivable. I mean, and, and the, the barriers are put by states in many cases, but it's something that has to happen. Movement of people, well, something similar. Why a person in the Commonwealth has to go through the torture of giving even you a great grandmother a, a, a birth certificate to get a visa to move from one country of the Commonwealth to another. Anyway, those are the, the issues. Climate change is also a very important point in the agenda. We can never forget, for, forget it. And, and we were doing pretty well in climate change. And still, I think there is hope. But certainly, now we know very well that the tensions between two of the main countries in the Commonwealth and we are trying to negotiate and see how to moderate that discussion, not to dilute the topic to a point where it stops being changed and remains just climate. And finally, uh, yes, we have 295 members of staff uh, with a budget that is meager if we compare it with the past. I really believe we do miracles um, because the budget of the Commonwealth Secretariat is uh, less than ten, the tenth of the budget of any ministry, for example, in the UK, and, and much smaller than any big ministry across the Commonwealth. So, but a lot is done, is achieved with that mega budget. And still, we have a problem of underspend <laughs> sometimes. So, those are more or less well and the work of the CFTC certainly the development arm of the Commonwealth quite a lot is done and here you have the usual tension which I already saw when I was in, in UNEP in 96, 97 back then there was a tension between after the Berlin Wall collapsed the developing world and the developed world and this continues 
And this is the, the tension I also sometimes see in the Commonwealth when we are told by some countries, focus on democracy and rights, and others, hey, we want to focus on development. Say, well, development, and, and, and of course, sadly, the countries that want us to focus on democracy and governance are the ones with the money. So I am the beneficiary, because all the money comes to me, but certainly, we have to make our democracies sustainable. And this is done through enhancing their developmental needs. Otherwise, those rights and those uh, elections and, or the, will collapse. It's just a matter of time. Well, and I want to thank you all very much. Thank you, Chair. I think I took a little bit more than I should. But if there are any questions with the permission of the Chair, I'm happy to to answer them. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Colleagues, are there questions from the floor that you'd like to put to Professor Franceschi? Okay. Mark Robinson. Um, first, first of all, Professor, thank you for that wonderful talk. Um, many years ago, um, I was responsible for helping design and set up the first ever Commonwealth Observer Group, although it's not in the list. Because the country was not in the Commonwealth, Zimbabwe only came into the Commonwealth after that. And I've also been an election observer four times. In terms of election observant, because we, we've been talking about money here, um, is the Commonwealth Secretariat still able to get sufficient funding to do Commonwealth election observance in a way that meets the high standards we put to it? Uh, no. <laughs> so basically, yes, we have responded to all the requests we get. That's fantastic. We go and we do election observation. Uh, from that point of view, I would say yes, we are able to respond to those requests. No, because selection observation has become, as you very well know with your experience, a much more complex process, where the expectations are now much higher and much more technical, and the re that requires a huge amount of funding. So we go to observe a few days before the election, the observer spent maybe one, two weeks, depending in the country. Uh, the European Union, as you know, uh, sends observers for almost six months. Of course, for them, it's a job. For us, it's a group of prominent people who have the experience and the, the weight, the moral uh, character to prevail upon the state to do it well but certainly has become quite a, a technical uh, uh, issue in many countries where election transmission of results is done electronically, and we are looking into that. But certainly it's a priority. So the election uh, section has never found itself short of funds because if we, they don't have funds, we take it from somewhere else. But we are very happy with the funds we receive from specific donors, and the UK and Australia have been exemplary in that case. Uh, thank you. Um, question from David Jones and then Arif Zaman. If I could take these two questions together, please. Louis, thank, thank you, David Jones. Um, thank you very much for the... Um, uh, working in the partnership, working the welcome to Chogham and the opportunity to address the, the meetings. I'm just wondering that the, the picture you described of a world in conflict with leaders increasingly anxious, increasingly looking into internally, nationalism, even the UK enacting legislation to stop protest. Not a very congenial atmosphere for working with civil society. Um, and in partnership working. And I wonder if you have some vision um, beyond VJ's research, which is really important and, and welcome, and thank you for the group that's been set up um, to support that, and Nicholas is involved with that. But do you have some sense of how in this really conflictual context the Commonwealth can work with civil society in a constructive way? Perhaps we just need to keep the light on even. 
Okay, if we could have a brief question, please, from Arif, and then one from Karen, and then, colleagues, I think we should move on with our panel. Louis, I'm a business lecturer, um, business education. There's been a dramatic increase in the last three or four years in the appetite and interest of students in law, business, and accounting in examples outside of the North. Okay, you've got plenty of examples of that through your programs. The problem is, Louis, nobody knows about them. Or well, very few of these people, undergraduate students across our Commonwealth community, know about the impact that Commonwealth is having through your programs and other things. So what more can we do? What more can the Secretariat through to get more visibility of the Commonwealth's impact in business education courses, particularly in law, accounting and business, so that students can see the relevance of the Commonwealth? Dr. Karen Brewer, question? Thank you. Um, you mentioned the work you're doing in training civil servants on performances. Um, could I ask what you're doing in training them on issues to do with fundamental values and separation of powers, civic education, which is absolutely paramount to them understanding how the, how the Commonwealth and fundamental values should be implemented? Thanks. Thank you. Very, very valid, valid points, very good questions. Um, one thing we came up with and to, to show you that this concern is real and we also speak about it in the Secretariat all the time was the Marlboro House Dialogues. Uh, this is an initiative we started some months ago and it's basically the Commonwealth speaking to the world giving a platform to our state, to, to our member countries to tell the story and also put them on the spot. We did something very beautiful with Kenya. We knew that the country was deeply polarized and there was hate speech and there would be violence in, in August, in the August elections. And we said, well, we cannot wait until uh, this happens for us to come and, and uh, strike our chest and say, oh my God, you know, this uh, CMAG will have to act, it's too late. So we invited Ray Laudinga and William Bruto to come, and some of you were there in the room, and they both committed themselves to accepting the results of election, whatever way it went, and going to court if there was any dispute. After this, the Chief Justice came and said, I commit myself to go constitutionally, be fair, etc., in the judgment and the like. And until yesterday, we had the Director of Public Prosecutions and pushing down their team, his team, uh, the idea of, well, you have to be professional and honest in the prosecution of electoral offenses. So, of course, there are all the things that happen in the background but the Marlboro House Dialogues is about talking to the world and telling the world this for us to communicate a little bit better. This goes also along with the question from Arif. We have to be much more vocal. But you know, partly, uh, yes, we, we fear somehow speaking out because of the fear of failure, which is something that affects all these international organizations, governmental organizations, if I say anything, I may annoy one or two of my member countries. Say, so, well, but that's precisely how the dynamic has to change. Because you are there not as a cheerleader, but as a doctor, which has to cut the injury, poor, poor spirit, and, and pain will happen, but the pus is removed, the infection is cured. So, visibility is something we have to improve. I, I thank you for this, and I think it's something that will be one of the main aspects we will be looking at in Chogam, in the conversations with leaders, and I'm sure this will come up in the retreat again and again, the idea of visibility, how can they listen to us? Uh, and then separation of powers. Uh, Karen, uh, I am grateful for your push, because you're always pushing this, and you even told Raila and Bruto the same idea. <laughs> But, you know, uh, we have to be perhaps more intelligent in the way we approach our member states. They will not naturally come to you to tell you, please teach me separation of power, so to be fair or to be 
they, they are quite happy and they don't accept much criticism. So we have to be intelligent and the way we approach it perhaps have to be different, have to be more constructive and have to be like we have done with the management, a performance management that we created a culture where now they're saying, hey, I don't want to be left behind. And then Maldives jumped in, and Barbados jumped in, and Namibia, and Nigeria, and everyone wants to see, okay, what's happening with performance management that I'm not doing? So I think that's, that's the idea, perhaps to be a little bit cleverer, and with your help, the accredited organizations, to pitch it to them in a way that they will be happy to be told where things are not going well and could improve. Thank you very much. Um, what we will now do is to move to our other speakers who I know will also want to put questions to Louis, who's kindly agreed to stay uh, for the rest of the session. So with that, Nicholas, I invite you to make your remarks, please. Thank you, Sue, and, and the Institute and the Roundtable for the opportunity to say a few words about, I think, the, both the Independent Forum of Commonwealth Organisations and our engagement with the Secretariat. And I hope I'm right in, in uh, feeling that there's, there's a new era of openness to communication with the FCO emerging or with, with Commonwealth organisations. Um, and I will I'll stand corrected, I've got two members of our uh, steering group in the room, Arif Saman, who was one of the co-founders of the IFCO back in 2015, and David, who's spoken before, still here. But um, is the Commonwealth working? I, I do ask myself how we would know or how the Commonwealth would know in the sense of the, I'm not sure what metrics the, the Secretariat uses for uh, review and analysis or who, who carries out the reviews. Um, and that would be very interesting to know. So what, what is the evidence underpinning claims made in the, the Secretary General's annual reports? That's an open question. Um, and of course, speaking for the IFCO, I have to ask, is the Commonwealth working for its accredited and associated organisations? And let me carry on. First of all, the IFCO, we set up in 2015 in response to the Secretary General on election saying that she was going to have much more frequent and open dialogue with Commonwealth organisations, which we welcome. So we set up, we meet quarterly. And I think in the first two years, we had one or two meetings with the Secretary General, so far less than we'd, we'd expected. Um, so we're set up to coordinate and channel, channel the voice of Commonwealth organisations, uh, both initially to prepare for meetings with the Secretary General that didn't happen as often as we'd hoped, and also to coordinate the submission, so the submission of Commonwealth organisations to the pre-COW uh, for the Commonwealth Heads of Government organisation. And I think that's probably the main focus, although we have had some discussion recently whether we don't focus too much on Chogham rather than uh, the two years, what we could be doing in the two years between Chogham's. Um, and I think we've also had a task in, or a commitment to identify and or develop clusters, the new cluster of sustainable urbanisation. We tried to set up one on culture and one of the key actors stepped down as Secretary General of, of the Commonwealth Association of Museums. Sadly, sadly the, the, the SG of ACLAUS, the Association of Commonwealth Literature and Language Studies died and that's one of the problems when you're reliant on a certain generation populate, populating Commonwealth organisations. Um, I'm afraid I stand as an example of that generation. Um, but we're also committed to reflexivity and transparency of Commonwealth organisations. We don't think we we've, have made historically enough of a case for the contributions that we make. Um, but I, I think it's fair to comment that our contribution tends to be invisible in the, in the Secretary General's annual reports or biennial reports. 
The website says countries are supported by a network of civil, cultural, intergovernmental and professional organisations, but you don't find much more, more substance to that. Um, we work with and through or via the Partnerships Office largely, although there's, there's a long history of uh, historic clusters, law, education and so on, that work very successfully with parts of the Secretariat. But I think presently there's a clear complementarity of interest of Commonwealth organisations with the foundation as it's currently focused, and two different parts of potentially the, a, a constructive whole. Um, I would comment in passing that the, the, the Secretariat's partnership strategy was designed without participation of Commonwealth organisations, which was a little odd, and I don't think that would, I don't think that would get through under current, in, in the current governance or the current regime. Um, so some of these things are, are historic points. Um, and there are other details around the Partnerships Office, which I think I should move beyond. Um, but we have been offered a project to assess the collective impacts of Commonwealth organisations on the Commonwealth. Um, what David has referred to as Vijay's project. Vijay didn't re 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 hasn't referred to it and didn't say it's my project. So we'll, we'll, we still have to have discussions around that. And there's a project advisory group put together uh, from the Commonwealth organisations and some others. But I think that is, that's going to be quite exciting because how do you develop metrics for soft power, for impact, for the collective impact rather than the individual impact? There's, there's a lot of prior thought. Uh, it's probably already gone into that, but uh, I, I think we're, we're going to discuss it further. Um, and we've been told, and, and, and we did refer to sometimes as an end of end of year budget and we just wonder whether we got lucky with an end of year budget surplus um, or whether there's a deeper meaning behind this uh, this project or the project to to identify our impact. Um, I did want just moving on uh, to some of you will remember this, it was referred to earlier by Anne Gallagher, the eminent people's group report, and it says on page 126, just over 10 years ago, the intergovernmental organisations of the Commonwealth should be more active in exploring how any of their work can be more effectively advanced in partnership with non-governmental organisations and vice versa. I won't quote the whole chapter and verse, but uh, I think Anne said let's revise or review the... the, the uh, EPG, the, the, the Eminent Persons Group report, and we have to, to recall that there was a high-level group report with its recommendations um, just in 2018 that has also not yet been followed up on because, of, because it hasn't yet been endorsed by heads, although it's been commended by uh, foreign ministers. And we had very good access to that I think no accident that, that it was being the consultant for that, who is in the room, David Gomez, uh, sort of opened the doors to us, and Anoti Tong was, was very receptive of civil society inputs. And one of the key recommendations was to move away from a transactional relationship with Commonwealth organisations to a, a more cooperative one. Uh, and part of that and beyond... We've also been waiting for a reform of the accreditation and classification procedures for a long time now. Um, but we hope that this, this new project that has been proposed is a sign of a, of a new dawn in relations. Now, if I go on to programmes, um, as I've said, different groups of Commonwealth organisations work very efficiently and effectively and have a long history um, Karen referred earlier to the Latimer House principles going back to the 20th, 20th, 20th and 25th anniversary of different parts of that. Um, and when we get to classification, of course, whether the law groups are associated organisations or accredited organisations is another long-term, long-standing interest of yours, I know, so we'll be waiting with bated breath to see if that... Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> to see if, if the, the uh, accreditation committee reports back. But I think we've had limited engagement with programs via partnerships office, and the engagement with programs tends to be bilateral, individual organizations or groups of organizations within, with groups within the Commonwealth, but with, within the Secretariat. But there's a lack of information about who's doing what and where in the Secretariat. Um, we got hold of, and Arif circulated a couple of weeks ago, the current uh, strategic plan, which at the time hadn't been on the Secretariat website. So we have to work to find things out when we think they, they should be readily accessible. So if we just say some specific program, mention some specific programs, um, my favorite would be the Blue Charter because it's got a very high principle. It's critical for SIDS. It's visible and doing as well as it can under the governance structures it has and with the financial constraints it has. So it's, you know, it's got champion countries. And uh, I don't know what the results are, but the process is convincing and the, it, there's a very good team behind it. Of course, I would say that because I would also claim that there was an initiative, a partnership of the Foundation and the, the Commonwealth Policy Studies Unit and the Commonwealth Human Ecology Council back around 2009 that launched at, at the Trinidad and Tobago Chogham and followed up at the Perth Chogham and, and talking to foreign ministers. And this is obviously, it's, it was a SIDS uh, initiative and, but you have to be walking through the door as it opens for you. And, and we do think that Commonwealth organisations have taken the initiative frequently in provoking or developing, helping develop programmes. And I think that's one of the things we have to, to take care of and look after. The Living Lands Initiative to be announced at Kigali we haven't had consultations so far, but I don't know if colleagues in the audience have been involved in, in its development. But that's supposed to be the, the terrestrial equivalent of, of the Blue Charter. So we'll be interested in seeing what happens there, but it would have been nice to know what's sort of in, in, in preparation. Nicholas, um, excuse me, I'm keen that Misha should also have the opportunity to make her remarks. So could I invite you to wrap up, please? Then we'll be okay. Also Time for I think afterwards. if I could just uh, say other things that uh, Commonwealth organisations contribute to, we know that the education and the environment and the law and the health ministers meetings involve substantial inputs from Commonwealth organisations. The education ministers uh, has been reliant on them, on them, and I think in the future, I think it's, it's important. The Commonwealth brand is important to Commonwealth organisations. If the Commonwealth has a good reputation, Commonwealth organisations can, can generate resources and mobilise support. Um, and things the Commonwealth is good at, I think, is recognising and giving access to civil society. Practical ideas would be focused on reparations at this stage. This is speaking personally. Um, there are things IFCO has to do. I won't dwell on those now. I will say about the gorilla in the room, because they're talking about de democracy, Chogham is going to a country where 98% of the votes went for the incumbent. I hope the 2% are still free and walking around and, and in, in Rwanda. But I think there's a real question of, of democratic values and that sort of result. And I would really, again speaking personally, so. Uh, welcome as a sign of commitment to democracy the release of Paul Rusa Sabagina, hero of Hotel Rwanda, um, in the run up to the Rwanda Chokan. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. Um, thanks to Sue, the, in the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, and all of the other organizers for inviting me. I want to start by saying hello. 
I'm really pleased to be here to see old colleagues and friends, both in person for the first time in a long time, and online. Um, it's good to see that we're still committed to the Commonwealth and that we are concerned about its future. Um, I am warning you that I'm neither an academic nor a regular public speaker, and yet I took the hot spot, the last, because I think what my topic is, is of concern to all of us across all of it. Um, is the Commonwealth getting its message across? And I think, really, the answer is no. Uh, keeping in mind what Dr. Franceschi said about the crisis of identity, this midlife crisis that a lot of international organizations are going through, um, there is definitely a need to refresh and to rethink and to relaunch. Um, what Nicholas just mentioned about the relying on a certain age group to populate Commonwealth organizations, that, that ties into what really is a bit of an echo chamber and a problem for non-governmental and governmental organizations alike. I would say that the Commonwealth, if because we are not going to have time, nor are we interested in talking about the other international organizations for now, um, has in particular an image issue, a message issue, a vision issue, an information sharing issue, a partnership and network issue, and a feedback and learning issue. Now obviously I cannot speak to all of them at length, but I will touch on each of them because I don't want it to sound like that's a criticism. It is a, it is a stark, unfortunate statement of fact, yes? Um, the image issue, what is the Commonwealth? What does, it, what does it look like now? Does it look like this room? Or does it look like that one girl over there who is younger than the rest of us by 25 years? Right? <laughs> <laughs> what does the Commonwealth actually look like? Um, and are we creating it in its image or in our image? What is the Commonwealth's message? What should it be? What is it? It is a bit of a cop-out to say the government set the message. Um, because if that's the case, we are nothing. We are amorphous. We are 54. We are 2.5 billion. We are nothing. What is the vision? What does the Commonwealth want to be? Both the organizations, the, the associations, and the people. What is the vision? Um, I, I mentioned, what's the message? So what is it, and then how do we share that what, right? Some thinking needs to go into this, and it doesn't need to be an eminent persons group or a high-level group. It needs to be a bunch of people perhaps sharing a Commonwealth drink, talking about what it is that makes the Commonwealth the Commonwealth. Yes, it's the common laws. Yes, it's rugby cricket. Um, yes, it's you know all of the foods that have crossed, um, you know, and crossed and recrossed the the oceans. What is it that makes us the Commonwealth? Um, the partnership and network issue. Uh, just briefly, I want to say that there are two aspects to this. There is the fact that working in partnership, the Commonwealth does not actually, perhaps. Uh, what, I, I don't know the reason, but it doesn't actually exercise its full partnership in whatever it does. And that works for it and against it. Because if, if the initiative doesn't work, well, they weren't leading. But if it does work, they also don't get the credit. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it, also within networks, you know, so be more of a partner, be more involved in the network. Um, and, and use Brown Commonwealth. I come from a country of three million people, but Jamaicans believe that we own the world. And we act as if we own the world. And many of you probably didn't know that there are only three million of us. <laughs> so um, so it, it is, there is a way to partner and network and amplify your voice and your message once you know what it is. Uh, the feedback and learning issue, everyone here has spoken a little bit about this. How do we get better? We get better by listening. We get, we get better by taking on board what people say and doing better next time, right? There are no feedback mechanisms that I can find on the website. 
because I wanted to complain about the fact that I couldn't find any information to prepare for this meeting. And I wanted to complain privately because I didn't want to air that dirty laundry, but here I am because I came across a lot of page not founds and not a no way to contact the Commonwealth to say your mandates are missing. The strategic plan is missing, right? It doesn't look good. It's not a good look for an international organization. Also, as a policy maker, how do you find information about the Commonwealth? How do you find what the Commonwealth is doing? Um, in the midterm review, um, one of the recommendations was uh, around the fact that there isn't enough evidence-based support for the outcomes and the deliveries of, the, of Commonwealth activities. That's a huge failing. If you're doing good work, you need to talk about it. Now, Dr. Franceschi chose two very good examples of good work, except they're in the area, the one area where you cannot talk about it. As a former conflict resolution practitioner myself in a previous life, before the Commonwealth, um, it's always hard to prove a negative. How do you prove the lives that were saved? How do you prove the wars that did not happen? Well, the Commonwealth works in other areas where they can prove what happened. They can prove, they can prove how many people were trained. They can prove how many people's lives were improved, even if incrementally, even if in partnership. So why don't we do that? Um, and so, in, I'm going to sum up because I, I know I don't have a lot of time and I know people have questions and I think that I don't, I wasn't planning to be provocative or controversial. I don't think I was because I look around and everyone's agreeing, right? So what we're saying is we actually know what the problems are, right? What we need to do is sit down and figure a way to, to get better, to get better at um, promoting what we do well. Um, which is consensus building, working in partnership. Um, some slightly boring but useful work around institution, strengthening institutions. But that being said, um, there are ways to make it interesting. Testimonials, explainers, um, looking at you know, getting a young civil servant from Lesotho to talk about how to use the uh, climate finance access, you know, actually humanizing the Commonwealth to the people um, not in this room who will take us into the next uh, century. That's it for me. Thank you very much, Nikonisha. <laughs> Colleagues, are there questions, please, from the floor? David Gomez, you have a question. I, I do have a comment. Uh, first of all, th thank you to all three presenters for this afternoon. Uh, Misha, I think you were, for me, quite uh, uh, provocative in the ways I thought it needed to be. Um, and I will make a comment. I'm not sure I have a question, but just more comment to on what you say. Um, there used to be a time when you would look at global issues and where the Commonwealth was in, ter in the line of who was addressing that. And they were always in the first three or four. Um, there is, I, in my view, there, the Commonwealth is in a position now where it's not in the first 20 international organizations addressing that issue. I don't see how we, it could be claimed to be a, a leading organization if it's not in the forefront of addressing critical issues facing Commonwealth countries. I just, it, 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 it trouble, I, I don't lose sleep over it, but I just, it, it, the, the misalignment is, is so great that I just don't see it. I, I think a large part of the problem is, as Misha has pointed out, is that the brand value perception of the Commonwealth is just not there in any way you look at it. But the, the, the Secretariat has failed to embrace um, the ready cohort of, of, uh, of stakeholders that can help to expand the existing brand, uh, um, brand and to deliver, um, I think, the impact that it needs to have. And I've had discussions with furious people over the fact that the voices of people in the Commonwealth are just not heard. There's absolutely no one from the corners of the Commonwealth that's heard. And there, as you rightly pointed out, there are no, there are no existing channels for that to be heard. Um, we've, I've tried 
with Arif to try to do something via uh, his radio program. But I think it's, uh, there's much more than that. that I, I'll end that on that and say that there's significant room for growth. And I'm sure the Secretariat and the wider Commonwealth family can embrace that and make it happen. I was just going to say, are you sure that the Commonwealth wants to be one of the first five leading organizations? Um, a question here, um, Dr. Balachandra, and then Carl Watts. Hello, um, this is about the uh, Commonwealth taking pride for uh, partnerships. And um, there are two areas which I think uh, are very important and where probably Commonwealth can make a bigger impact than what it is making at the moment. The two issues are climate change, and in terms of climate change, Commonwealth needs to capture a lot of work that is done outside its own um, organizational structure or even the associations. For example, Canterbury has a very active climate action partnership and it is in a Commonwealth country and it is doing very well, but it doesn't come under the radar of the Commonwealth. Then the second one is about the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, the Secretary has uh, done very good job in terms of preparing um, some of the pedagogic material on using uh, SDGs. But in terms of partnerships, for example, Bristol City is seen as a good example of local uh, um, local uh, assessment of uh, sustainable development goals achievements. And it's been quoted in the, in the UN, uh, uh, UN pro programs as well. But Bristol is in the UK, a common country, and we need to capture the success of Bristol if we want to say that it is part of the Commonwealth plan. Thank you. I'm going to take um, a collection of questions. A question from Dr. Carl Watts, and then Arif, you have, uh, Arisana has a question. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, two questions, um, but just maybe introduction. I, I, I remember some years ago meeting President Mohammed um, Nasheed in Maldives um, when he'd just taken on office and was championing climate change, and he'd just been released from prison. And uh, of course, not long afterwards, he was <laughs> deposed in an undemocratic uh, action as, as well. And he made the point that if he hadn't been released from prison, in other words, through pressure on human rights, he wouldn't be able to pursue his developmental aims. So to me, there's no contradiction between the Commonwealth pursuing both democracy and development. The two are interlinked, as, as President Rashid demonstrated at the time. But, but two questions I have. Um, first of all, it, can the Secretariat in particular not find stronger mechanisms to collaborate with the associated and with the accredited organizations who, as we've heard this all of today, have vast amounts of expertise, have huge networks, and ability to support the work in quite specialized areas. And I think the uh, EPG report, which was referred to, does actually have a paragraph on that, which I think was never fully implemented. So I think I'm looking for more, Nicholas has touched on this, more concrete mechanisms for the Secretariat to really outsource its work to the competent Commonwealth Associated and Accredited Organizations. And my second point is something I was touched on briefly this morning, um, regionalization. Again, to me, there's no contradiction between regionalization and the Commonwealth or global action. Um, and, and the EU is a very good example. Um, when I was heading the Commonwealth of Government Forum, we received a, a very large amount of money, I mean millions, from, from the European Union, which happily is still to some extent continuing despite the nonsense of Brexit. Um, so I think, I think there is a linkage there, but what I specifically want to give as an example is that in the local government forum, we have regional offices uh, for the Pacific in Fiji, for the Caribbean in Trinidad, for Africa in Pretoria and, and in Accra, and for Asia in Mumbai. Now, those are very small offices. They're, they're only a few staff, uh, but they're program offices above all. It comes back to the point about programs. And I think that's one way where Commonwealth organizations can gather more traction by having regional offices. And is that not a way forward, like we used to have in the youth program, which somebody mentioned? Not least because it then it also involves the members in those regions. And, and certainly in our case, it was all started by people from those regions to make it not just a London-centric organization. So the regionalization of our work and um, greater outsourcing to competent Commonwealth bodies from the Secretariat. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, Arif Salman, another question, and then the panelists will, the panelists will respond. We think about two and a half billion citizens in the Commonwealth. There are a few issues that are more relevant to them than insurance and occupational health and safety. It affects everyone everywhere in different ways. In the last 18 months, the two global bodies that represent those communities chose to join the Commonwealth. They became accredited organizations. Why? Um, panelists, do you want to respond to those questions? See? Do you want to? No, start, please. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's your, it was your time. Oh, I've got this one, too. So. Okay. Shall I start? Okay. Yes, I, I don't think most of those questions are, are directed to, to me, but uh, in fact, while I was listening, there were a couple, especially to the first gentleman, a, a concrete suggestion for the, um, for the Commonwealth Secretariat might be um, for it actually to request um, on its social media and on its website, um, hashtag Commonwealth Stories so that actually it would drive people there to share their stories and to also see what else is doing and then make those exactly those informal um, you know sort of um, stretchy links that we managed to do so well you know to find out um, what's going on I think that might be a way to um, democratize the process um, I would say about this accredited although this is not for me but this this um, this um, this stronger mechanisms to collaborate um, I, I, I suspect part of the problem for the Commonwealth Secretary is resources. Um, in fact, if you just mean that you want to be branded Commonwealth, that's something else. But if you want money from the Commonwealth Secretary, I think that's, a, that's an issue. And if you're waiting for that, you may wait a long time. But if, if, if you want to be accredited um, or affiliated, I think, uh, again, in this social media world, you can use hashtags. You can you can you can reverse into an affiliation and an association, um, and you can also bring money. Uh, that's it for me for those questions. As as far as regionalization, yes, it all works, doesn't it? Um, everything that advances our our goals are 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 useful, whether it's local, whether it's um, um, yeah, regional, um, or whether it's global. My apologies that my phone went off at that point. So <laughs> I think that was on purpose. <laughs> it was trying to save me. Now, uh, keep on going. <laughs> now, uh, well, I am very grateful, and I, I would like to tell Misha. We still need you in the Commonwealth. I don't know why you left I'm the Secretariat. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> um, because the points are very relevant. I mean, it is true. We are not very good at communicating what we do. I think there is an overload of information. It's something we all suffer from, even inside the Secretariat. Uh, let me give you a little story. When I came in, uh, Two weeks later, I was asked, why are there three teams from your department in Trinidad at the same time doing three different things? I said, well, we have to stop this. And we started having some meetings, coordination. We put in place a, a system to know who is going what and if we can combine efforts. But you know, this is very typical of international organizations because people believe knowledge is power. And you sit on your little a uh, shamba, we would say in Kenya, and this is you as nobody touches it. And this is one of the biggest problems uh, we face internationally, well, I mean, in the, in the Commonwealth and, and, and elsewhere, because it happens in many places. We have to become better at putting the story out there, to be more humane in the way we do it. It's very true. Uh, certainly, we are trying in many ways. For example, in this program, we will have the inaugural Commonwealth legal debate for young people. And this is partly because we ask, OK, what are we doing for the young people? Oh, the youth forum. Okay, that's not enough. We have to engage the youth much more than just talking among themselves. They have to talk to the leaders. And we have to create that inter intergenerational dialogue, which is there already. The Cambridge Policy Fellowship, where you have young fellows uh, creating innovative solutions for small island developing states. 
uh, you have issues to do with uh, the Oxford uh, Policy Fellowship, where uh, this is very simple, it's, it's a kind of partnership where young people from Commonwealth countries move to other countries and they are embedded in ministries and they help those ministries create uh, innovative systems or new systems. For example, we had one who was embedded in the Ministry of Finance in Uganda and developed the PPP unit in the Ministry of Finance in Uganda. So they are, and, and countries go asking for it. So it's very interesting. There are many beautiful things happening, but I agree. Uh, we have to design the way of communicating the beautiful story that takes place in Marlborough House to the world in a much better way and more meaningful. Thank, thank you, Liz. Um, yeah, on regionalization, I really do think the time has come to, to look again at the potential and the timeliness of, of a regional commonwealth. We discussed recently um, replicating the IFCO at national level, and someone said, well, regional might make a lot more sense. You know, we look at the African regions, Caribbean, Pacific, and I think that's right, and that would also mean that you get more bottom-up activity from the Commonwealth organisations, and it doesn't look so London-centric. And that would also necessarily change the demography of, of the, the faces you see, the, the talking heads. Um, I think also that there's a question going beyond that to links. There aren't that many green organisations in, in the Commonwealth uh, in the IFCO because the Commonwealth Foundation was set up in the mid-60s and the environmental issue took, up, took off later. And we've got the opportunity, though, to link up with global organisations addressing key climate and biodiversity issues. Um, and a lot of them have offices in Commonwealth countries and know which ones they are. And I've, I've recently been talking to IUCN and they're interested. But I, it's not at a stage I can even take the idea to the, the steering group yet. But I think that's something else we should be looking at of to, uh, key organisations that are not Commonwealth accredited and would no longer think Commonwealth accreditation is something they, they would want to engage in. Now, we didn't mention the, the Sustainable Urbanisation Initiative, which I think is, is another key theme that's come out of Commonwealth organisations. Um, again, an initiative from the Commonwealth, but working with the, with the Secretariat, the Local Government Forum and the planners and so on. And that has got traction uh, with Rwanda in their, their sort of smart cities approach. But that's my, my comment on regionalisation. I think the time may have returned. Colleagues, I'm going to take one more round of questions before bringing this panel to a close. Sandy, question here. Um, yes. Um, just a, a very brief question because I think I'm out of date on um, uh, that there were several mentions of metrics and strategic development goals, millennium development goals. Um, I was in charge of the strategic planning division up until 2008, and at that po point in time, we were putting in place results-based management, with the with the hope that that would be, you know, um, uh, a bit of a, a magic move forward for the foreseeable future. I'd love to hear very briefly um, what, what, how the secretary is now um, undertaking um, evaluation, and I'm very mindful that the methodologically you need very different approaches for, on the one hand, programs and projects that you are proactively designing yourselves, and on the other hand, the, the very, very responsive kind of work. Um, for example, when a country requests a CFTC expert on a quite specific subject, you haven't necessarily foreseen that request, but you still need to be able to prove that the work delivered with, against it was effective. So just a very brief update I would find interesting, and I hope, hope other colleagues might also. Thank you, Sally. Um, William Horsley, you have a, a question. Uh, William Horsley, good afternoon, Professor. Uh, I wonder if you'd just respond to what Nick was saying about the sensitivity of holding the Chogham in Rwanda. I, I mean, you, you can't perhaps talk entirely frankly, but, you know, there is a, a sense that this was, a, you know, it was a very controversial and possibly wrong-headed decision. But the, the main thing I'm 
I suppose I ask you about is the actually what, it, what how it's being organized, whether access to the media and other participation is adequate. Because, for example, I understand that there's no uh, streaming of the People's Forum, and I don't know what the plans are for the. Uh, the main one, I suppose, is accreditation and the, uh, the possibility of free speech in a country like Rwanda. Um, question from Amitav. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll be very brief, um, and it's really to Louis. Firstly, it was music to my ears to hear that you are now looking at election observation as a cyclical thing, that an election is not an event but a process, and that observer groups don't just go there on the day and go away and it's forgotten about till the next election. So if you can make that happen, that would be fantastic. Uh, my question relates to another concern that came up earlier in the discussion today when you weren't here, which is about CMAG. When CMAG was formed, it was a pioneering Commonwealth institution. Um, I remember others speaking enviously about it, saying, how did you people in the Commonwealth manage to get agreement on a body that actually sits in judgment and can wrap countries on the knuckles for crossing the line? Um, we, we, we would probably say that Commonwealth Africa is doing much better than Francophone Africa in terms of adherence to Commonwealth values. But of late, there is a concern that uh, there is regression happening. I think COVID has enabled a lot of countries to have more draconian practices put in place. Um, nationalism has been mentioned, um, jingoism, xenophobia, etc. How is CMAG performing, and is there a concern that CMAG's role needs to be really revitalized as well? Three very good questions. Um, speakers. Excellent. Three, three, thank you. Well, thanks a lot for those difficult questions. Um, well, first, I will begin by the last one which falls squarely into something we have been working on for the past uh, few weeks, CMAG. Uh, in the last one year, there have been five coup d'etats in Africa, four of them in Francophone Africa, one in Sudan. Uh, thank God there is no uh, Commonwealth African country in the bottom spectrum of the governance index by the Mo Ibrahim Foundation. They are all in the top um, third, or some of them in the, in the middle. Of course, that's not reason for celebration. We know there are serious problems in some countries, and we know there are serious concerns we have to address. Now, CIMAG has not met for the last two years in person. The meetings have been virtual. And while situations and circumstances continue being addressed, uh, in, a, in a very persistent way, we can say that the virtual meetings do not allow us the flexibility and the impact we could have if we had met in person. Why? Because anything that is written, is written. And it can be passed to the country, which is perhaps being discussed as a concern, not on the, on the agenda, because those countries are usually invited to present their case, but even as a matter of concern. The, the other point that I think plays a role here is that in many circumstances, and this is a sad reality, we have a little bit of a condescending attitude towards other countries. Uh, for example, um, when you say, well, uh, 10 people died in whatever. It could be in country X, in Japan, which is not in the Commonwealth, not to risk anybody. Uh, in Japan, we have to put them in CIMAC. Hey, but wait a minute. If this is a persistent, consistent, and serious violation, or was this a mistake, or was this an abuse, or was this, I mean, what is the type? Because we tend to look at these issues uh, well, in a very accusative way, and we have to be careful not to put countries off when actually what you have to do is to walk them with by the hand, to grab them by the hand and accompany them to come out of a specific problem they are going through. 
This is why CMAC remains the last resort. But to give you an example that I can mention uh, publicly, because they themselves mentioned it publicly, at some point we had a meeting with members of the House of Lords and, and a, a, a committee on Cameroon, and they told us, you have to expel Cameroon from the Commonwealth because President Bia has been there for too many years. And what they did not know is that the opposition themselves have to last if President Bia goes, there is civil war. So you cannot let President Bia go just like that. I mean, it's not a matter of changing leaders. So countries have their own situation, their own cultural environment, their own circumstances. And of course, we have to learn to respect those circumstances but of course, where there are violations and there are serious problems of human rights, we have to go in and somehow grab them by the hand. I think CIMAC is the failure of governance and peace. You take people to CIMAC when we have failed in our work and there is nothing else that can be done. As it was done, for example, in the case of uh, Malawi when they went through difficulties some years ago and it was done with Guyana also, they were put on the formal agenda, as it was done in cases you know very well of countries that were expelled or had to leave the Commonwealth uh, because going into unconstitutional forms of government. But okay, we keep on trying. However, um, I think there is reason for hope because still countries are continue to be discussed in CIMAC when there are serious and persistent violations and they are put on notice. And this has happened quite a number of times uh, in the last, let's say, three years or so, and I have seen it with my own eyes. Of course, it is true, this is not uh, publicized. Uh, it is not publicized unless they are put on the formal agenda, which is uh, a very serious issue, and this goes into the, the statement CIMAC members usually make uh, at the end. Regarding Rwanda, uh, you know the sea of Chogam is chosen by the members themselves. So certainly they chose Rwanda, uh, and I would say it is true there is no perfect country in the Commonwealth, uh, but and, and, and they are concerns. All of them have one concern or another. But again, I would say perhaps Chogam will be the opportunity for a country like Rwanda, as it may have happened in the past uh, with Chogam in the United Kingdom, Chogam in Trinidad, Chogam in Colombo is the opportunity for the host country to style up in whichever way they need to, because it's no perfect country. So more than looking at it and saying, how can new members go to country X? I say, well, perhaps this discussion will be so fruitful. It's like water in a garden that will make it green. And perhaps it's the opportunity for Rwanda to improve in whichever way they have to improve, considering at the same time that Rwanda is a country with a very painful history. I mean, they went through a genocide that, uh, well, marks a generation or several generations, and we have to, to consider that and take that into consideration. Um, because at the same time, I think partly some of these governments have could go wrong because we stopped supporting, advising, helping them, accompanying them, walking the, the somehow at the top. And then regarding impact analysis, um, yes, we have the KPIs, key performance indicators. I mean, I think every member of staff is under huge pressure. We are few um, for the number of programs we have, and we are few for the, for the output that is expected from us. Um, wow, it's uh, I, uh, the people in the Commonwealth, in the Secretariat, have no timetable practically. Uh, they go 24 7. Uh, Amira <laughs> knows how it goes. Um, and, and well, it's, it's part of the, the beauty of the Commonwealth that never sleeps. 
so some, yesterday we had a meeting with uh, one country in the Pacific at 11 p.m. and that was quite late for them. They wanted, I mean, quite early. They wanted to have it at 12 midnight. So, but anyway, yes, I think people have a very stringent system of accountability. <coughs> uh, we have to be better at measuring the impact. As you say, it's difficult, and as Misha said, it's difficult to, in, to measure the impact of what did not happen. But, well, um, yeah, we have to create ways of measuring the impact uh, properly and especially in those areas which are not technical, but are more political, because sometimes it's, it's, it's a huge <coughs> challenge. I don't know if I have answered all the questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, yes. Um, I think the, the, the question about Rwanda raises also a question of the chair in office role, because we, we've, we've found that the UK Foreign Office Commonwealth Union was very supportive of Commonwealth organisations and the IFCO in the run-up to the London Chogaman has been continuously engaged since with us um, supportively and yet the government of Rwanda, uh, Yamina Karitanyi, the, the High Commissioner, said that they would not participate in IFCO meetings unless the Commonwealth Secretariat had senior representation there and the Commonwealth Secretariat wouldn't send senior representation. I think the deputy SG agreed to come and then cancelled at the last minute. But I, I think it's worrying that there's not going to be any live streaming from Rwanda. Um, I do though recall that after after the Sri Lanka Chogam there were elections and Rajapaksi got kicked out. He, he, he got, then he got back again. Thank you, thank you, Karen. But I, I you know, I, I would certainly cross my fingers and hope that Louis' optimism is 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 right. But I I think there is there is a question about what a host nation's high commission does to support the engagement with Commonwealth civil society in the run up to and in the in the running of Chogan. Sorry, just to clarify, I forgot about this. Uh, yes, they, they will be live streaming. Oh. If they did not want to make it public because they did not want to prevent people from going to Chogam. I mean, Rwanda has really suffered with by, by waiting for two years. I mean, for this, for them, this is a major meeting in London. In, in London, it would be just a drop in an ocean, but there is is a huge rainfall. <laughs> So they have spent a lot of money and they really need all of us to be and to invest and to spend money in Chigali. Uh, so, but the, the, we, are, we are planning and, and constantly talking to them about the importance of live streaming uh, in one way or another. It's not a virtual forum, it's not a hybrid forum, but at least it will not remain just in the room. It will be... Have you got agreement on that? Um, <laughs> Why are you making it so difficult? <laughs> but yes, I think that there is a, a there is an agreement on this on this issue that it will be shown across, but certainly it's not a hybrid forum. It's a presential forum, so there will be no possibility of somebody from wherever Cambodia intervening. That possibility is not there, but at least they will have access to the discussions and, and listening to it. Colleagues, thank you very much indeed um, to our panelists. Thank you to your engaged questions from the floor. Um, and my thanks to you for your active engagement throughout the day. I think this final panel has drawn together the threads that um, Alex Stewart and I were seeking to do in terms of trying to address is the Commonwealth working and if not, why not? Where can it do better? What's it for? What is its relevance? And how can it seek to address the dysfunctional aspects of its modality and its composition? And indeed, as Misha has so clearly underlined, the importance of its clear vision. Um, we've discussed networks, leadership, values, and programs, which of course have all come together in this final session. Um, addressing questions of cooperation and uh, complementarity, 
monitoring and oversight and assessment of impact, and uh, we need active engagement on this. This question, is there a tension between transparency and accountability? Accountability to whom? I'm enormously grateful to the frank contribution of Professor Franceschi, um, recognizing the constraints with which, of course, he must speak. Um, my thanks to um, Dr. Nicholas Watts, and I would like to echo um, Professor Franceschi's appeal to Misha to come and help um, the Secretariat address <laughs> its communication issues, image, message, vision, information sharing, partnership and networks, feedback and learning issues, all key. As Joe Kibezo once said, you can have the most successful chocolate ever, but if nobody knows anything about it, it's as if it never took place. And going back to this question of Rwanda hosting the Chogum and going forward, Richard Bourne wrote a very important piece in the round table after the London Chogum, when almost, I would say by default, that Rwanda offered its location, its conference facilities, um, very much at the last minute. Why are there not key, key core criteria for heads to um, choose where the next location is going to be? Because Events, dear boy, events have moved on since 2018. States can come under enormous pressure in multiple ways. Governments can change direction. Information can come to light. So heads have a responsibility to themselves. So I would argue that in terms of processes and leadership, the Commonwealth needs to address this. It was 50 years after the crisis of Biafra that um, Nigeria hosted the Abuja Chogum. Rwanda is doing it a mere where are we? 30 years um, after the catastrophe of genocide. So I think there are questions of responsibility and leadership that we've addressed that come again back to states and leaders. But um, sincere thanks to everyone. Um, there is going to be a reception now, uh, so we can continue in fine Commonwealth informal style. Um, but I'd just like to thank our speakers, to thank our online audience, to thank our online speakers as well. Um, for what I hope you agree has been a very valuable discussion and I'm just going to hand over to Stuart uh, to make the final remarks. Alex refuses to take the public accolade that he deserves. Yes, if I can get back to um, I do want to just sort of slightly widen uh, the thanks on behalf of the the organisers and the partners, um, to first of all, uh, the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and Sue Onslow in particular. Um, I, I'm sure we were all delighted uh, that the day opened this morning with the Vice-Chancellor present um, and with her conveying such a positive message to us because we will all be very conscious that last year um, it looked as though we were going to see the last of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies and some of us have seen three or four occasions when that nearly happened. Um, but this extraordinary coalition, Commonwealth coalition arose and I'm happy to say um, helped, have helped, uh, we hope, set uh, the Institute on a new path uh, to, uh, where it can uh, have its regeneration. And I think seeing the relationship that Sue has with the Vice Chancellor now um, is very encouraging for the future. I think we also saw, you know, what the Institute can do and can be. We saw Sue and Kieran and Gemma and her team. We saw these excellent facilities that we've enjoyed today and the, uh, the way the catering has, has gone and all the rest of it. And we thought, yes, let's us be part of helping the Institute uh, recover and indeed build upon uh, where it is at the moment. So I think that's the first thing to the Institute of Commonwealth Studies. I do have, I want to thank my, um, my round table collaborators and friends, um, and first of all, Alex May, because you know, he's got a, a work capacity that is beyond anything uh, that I could possibly aspire to. And he's done a fantastic amount of work um, for this conference, and I want to thank him very much indeed.
And um, we have uh, Venkat I, the editor's been here today, and uh, Debbie, of course, is here. And so there will be quite a lot of outputs, I hope, through the journal and the website. Um, but the, the, fortunately, the roundtable was able to give quite a significant financial contribution. Other partners uh, mostly gave in other ways. Um, but uh, it did mean that, and the third fact must go, that we had excellent technical support possible. But I mean, you were able, I, I think we all know how difficult it is to have in person and uh, virtual running at the same time. And honestly, you made it look uh, seamless. And any, any breaks in transmission were entirely human error on our part, not, not yours. Uh, so, um, and then I think we've, we've had, uh, not just in this panel, but in all the panels, well-deserved thanks to the speakers and chairs uh, who have, I think, really prepared well. Um, there's been some very searching and hard and frank uh, questions and criticisms, um, but there's also been um, a desire to look ahead and to look uh, on the positive side and to try and come up with practical um, uh, suggestions and proposals for the future. Um, finally, I want to thank everybody who's come today. You know, it really is fantastic to, to be with everyone again. You know, you can feel that sense of perspective coming back, uh, which you lose when you're in a cocoon. And it's so great to see uh, familiar faces again and to, to talk to people like networking um, it, you just learn so much from other people's experiences um, some very natty dresses about not me but some very natty dresses no tracky bottoms no pajamas <laughs> you know, it's a great relief to see people fully clothed and <laughs> And I, you know, obviously our virtual audience won't quite have had the full benefit of that, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have had the great advantage that that can give us, which is that we've crossed time zones and we've had some very welcome participants um, from very far away. So as we prepare for Kigali. Uh, we do so, I think, with anticipation, but also with a fair degree of trepidation. Um, because I think we do know that there are many things that are not quite as we would wish them to be, uh, which we believe they could be. Um, we are, because we're, we're part of those networks that we began the day with, many of us are part of those networks. They're also sort of latent pools of power and, and potential. Um, that we know could do, could help the Commonwealth be so much better. So that makes us optimists, because that was the division we had today between optimists and pessimists, and most of us are probably optimists. Um, so we hope for the best for Kigali. I only hope our optimism is justified. Thank you.